Fresh Art International presents Fresh Talk, conversations about creativity in the 21st century. I'm Kathy Bird, Fresh Art producer, and today I'm in Austin, Texas with Joan Jonas, a phenomenal artist that I've known about for years and never had the chance to meet, so I'm thrilled about this. She is a seminal video and performance artist working in the transmedia process since the 70s. And in her work, she combines video, movement, music, sculpture, and spoken word to create nonlinear narrative compositions. And she's participated in Documenta at least four times, I know. And more recently, in the international scheme of biennial projects or, or international projects, she was in the Venice Biennale in 2009 with Reading Dante. This month, the University of Texas invited her to present The Shape, The Scent, The Feel of Things, a performance that was first commissioned by Dia Beacon in 2004, mm -hmm. I think, which leads to a lot of questions for me. I read that the piece evokes a, a snake dance sort of ritual, and I know ritual is very important in your work, but what about that particular dance resonated with you it's a snake dance, the Hopi snake dance, which I saw in the 60s in, this, in, in Arizona. And it was an amazing experience. I never wanted to do anything with it, frankly, because I didn't want to intrude upon the Native American culture because of the way we've treated them in this country. And also, it's sacred for them, and I don't quote anything of, from that experience. There's no visual images that, that evoke the Hopi. So for years I just, it was a memory and it was inspiring because I've always been interested in ritual as a kind of inspiration for my work. The ritual of other cultures and the ritual in our own culture, you know, and, and, and the history of art in, in the Western world includes ritual. Art begins with ritual. So I came across this book by Abby Warburg. Abby Warburg, German art historian, had visited the Southwest in the late part of the 19th century, the last years of the 19th century, went to visit the Pueblo Indians and saw many ceremonies, but not the, the snake dance, but he's written about it. I found a book, a, an essay that he had written about his experience when he was a patient at a sanitarium in Switzerland, and he had written this piece in order to demonstrate that he'd recovered from his nervous breakdown. And I was very inspired and moved by this piece that he wrote. So I decided to revisit this experience through his writing. Then in your practice, you con consistently connect the physical with the conceptual, and you've taken from the beginning, it seems to me, full advantage of all the new media props or technology that was available. And yet at the same time, you've maintained this really strong affinity for drawing. And I think oftentimes that's left behind. I was a sculptor before I stepped into performance in the late 60s. And the one uh, discipline that I really took with me, besides continuing to think of it as sculpture to making three-dimensional moving events, was the practice of drawing. And I'm very interested and I love to draw. And so I try to incorporate drawing in all my, almost all my performances and video pieces. And I also make drawings, I mean, that are independent of that. So each time I do a new work, I think of another way to include drawing or painting. So in this piece, I make a painting of a, a snake, which is the only reference that has nothing to do with a snake dance, but it, it's my way of referencing. And I also, I draw, if I draw on the, the content of each work, and so that inspires certain images that I can draw and be part of the visual all over picture of the piece. And it must affect the palette that you work with as well? Colors kind of creep in very minimally and of course my video is color mm -hmm. not black and white in the early in the 70s it was all black and white right. because that's what the technology was so the color in my work is really in the video and so any other color in the piece is very minimal for instance I worked with fairy tales at one point and there are certain colors in fairy tales red and white so of course I bring those colors or green and yellow I bring those colors into the the juniper tree, that I was totally, red and white. I was looking at the installation today Oh yeah. and realizing how much you stage your works and how working on a stage would be interesting for you, but at the same time, your early works, you were on the street, you were in your well, studio. Yes, I was all over. I'm interested in doing my work in different 
spaces. Mm -hmm. And in the early days, I never worked in a theater, for instance, where it was always in a gymnasium or outside or in a strange space, a loft space, because that was what was available and what was interesting at that time. Mm -hmm. The reason we're doing it on the stage here, this piece was originally commissioned by Dear Beacon, as you yes. said, and it was commissioned for that, it was really a site-specific piece for that space at that time, this enormously huge um, basement space with columns, beautiful 19th century factory space, and we used the, these long corridors of columns, and for me it represented the sanitarium, actually, that Warburg was in. You know, I spend a lot of time on my work, and the pieces have a real... Um, well, they exist, and so I want to do them again. This is the uh, fourth time we've done it again. Mm -hmm. And there just it aren't those kind of spaces. The only time it was comparable slightly was in Brazil in the Niemeyer building. But here, Stuttgart, we did it on a stage. It has to be reconfigured. Has the work evolved in a sense because of well, that? Well, no, I think it didn't evolve. It, it, it changed just a little changed. bit. Yeah. I mean, the work itself, it's all the same movements, the same videos, the same props, the same... But because of the change of space, the performance itself has to, in a way, become more intense to express... The space itself at Dia Beacon was really a large part of the piece, and it was beautiful. So I've noticed in this, um, this latest version, and also in Stuttgart two years ago, our performances take on another intensity in these kind of spaces. You work with a jazz innovator, Jason Moran, and he is with you every time you perform this piece. And I'm really interested in that, that there is some improvisational aspect to how you work together on once you're well, we presenting began, it. Well, of course, the kind of work, ja Jason is an improviser. Mm -hmm. um, we started out, he, he worked with me at the beginning when we were working out this piece, it was built on improvisation because that's the way one begins you play with ideas and you develop them so we worked together for six weeks actually and I brought already edited backdrops and the script and but I didn't have the movements so we worked on the movements we went scene by scene and Jason would play something and if I loved it or if I liked it or if I found it interesting at all we'd work with that if not then we'd go on to something else he's very inventive you, you, as you know so we developed a um, a score that way. Jason developed his the musical score in that way. We also work together, I work with sound, and he's wonderful because he's very open about improvising in that sense. Um, so it's always more or less the same, and his score has always the same motifs for each part. But he embellishes and brings in new sounds and experiments with the piano, and sometimes it sounds really electronic, what he's doing. So he's all the time, especially in this version in, in uh, Austin, he's really always bringing something else to it. But I'm always trying to do the same thing. <laughs> you know, I move, we all move in relation to, to hearing his music. We're not dancing to his music, but we're moving in relation. It's inspiring for us. From here, you have other presentations of this piece? We're trying to work on going to Los Angeles. And do you have other projects you're working on right now? That well, I'm working on one for Documenta. It's an installation, and then there'll be a performance in September. Again with Jason. He didn't do the music for my installation, but we... He worked on the Dante piece, mm -hmm. and, but in a different way from this. Mm -hmm. He doesn't play live. Right. But we're doing one where he's playing live in um, September 13th, 14th, 15th. It's called Reanimation. It'll have a different name by the time we do it in Documenta, but it's a very different... Kind of piece. Do you want to talk about the concept? It's inspired by an Icelandic writer, Haldor Laxness, a book he wrote called Under the Glacier. So it's a little bit about natural phenomenon and nature. It's also basically almost a solo piece, so it's a much smaller scale. But it's just a chance because Jason and I did a um, performance at MIT last fall, and then they heard about it and then they invited us. So I'm very glad to be working with him again.
You've been listening to Fresh Talk with Joan Jonas. Read more about Joan and hear other podcasts in this series on freshartinternational.com.